Hi, hello again, uh, welcome once again on my scientific channel Discover Social Sciences and in this video I am presenting another piece of educational content and this is another piece of educational content in the path of political systems. So this one is labeled the political systems number four or political systems hashtag four and he, I am presenting here the fundamental concepts uh, of electoral regimes. So the, the really fundamental things that you need to understand in order to go further in studying like the fine details of electoral regimes. In this video, as I usually like doing, uh, I use a real life case I refer once again to the constitutional system of Finland, which I have already discussed, I think, once in my preceding videos in this path of teaching political systems. So we use Finland as a case. And on this example, I am trying to explain you those basic distinctions as it comes to electoral regimes. So let's go. As usually, I have a nice PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, as I am a scientist and as due to COVID-19, I cannot really go to conferences and I cannot really go to class. I need to externalize somehow that innate compulsive push to using PowerPoint. So. Here is another PowerPoint presentation. Political systems number four, electoral regimes. Let's go. So here is the first idea or, or the first uh, basic concept that electoral regimes are institutions that regulate the appointment of elected officials. So that's the definition. And now I will start like from the end or from the bottom of the slide or from the last bullet point of the slide. You can notice probably if you observe even a little bit political events in many countries, you can notice that elections are like a ritual. Uh, they involve a lot of emotions, they involve a lot of money. Elections seem to be important. And, for example, I refer here to the case of Belarus, which is like next door to me. It is an authoritarian regime and everybody knows it. So technically, President Lukashenko could be ruling the country without pretending that he is uh, listening to the voice of the people. Yet, they make those elections happen every term regularly as a ritual that just needs to take place. And it is an interesting thing that even in clearly authoritarian regimes where we can just be sure that the ordinary citizens have no voice in appointing those real rulers of the country. Even in those regimes, even simulacre elections are being held. It is like a ritual. That ritual is rooted in the concept of political legitimation. Somehow, even when the political leader is the most, is the coldest calculating bastard you can imagine, they want to have at least the impression that they, that they have that popular political legitimation, so that they are publicly recognized as those who have the right to use and have political power. Whence that definition or a statement which I put here, popular vote is a way to acquire political legitimation, which means a publicly recognized right to have and use political power. Now, what we usually, uh, what we usually see as, or we, what we usually understand as elections, 
uh, are those situations when we vote, right? This is what we commonly understand by elections. Yet, in uh, the democratic system, you have essentially two types of elections or two types of democracy. There is the so-called direct democracy and indirect democracy. Direct democracy, it is when I vote and my vote directly contributes to the election of a person to a given office, mandate, seat, however we name it. In direct democracy, it is when I vote and my vote contributes to electing an official who in turn will vote to elect someone else. So in every democracy, we have like those two layers. We have the layer of direct democracy and we have the layer of the indirect one. So going back to my PowerPoint. So in a, a situation when a government official is appointed by direct popular suffrage is called direct democracy. And uh, uh, it is interesting to observe that each national political system has like a specific idiosyncratic combination of direct democracy and indirect one. It is commonly assumed that indirect democracy serves to like balance the power of those who have the most money and the most influence to run big electoral campaigns uh, excuse me campaigns in the field uh, so indirect democracy is usually like a check on direct democracy and vice versa okay let's go to the case study of finland i use here uh, quotes from the Constitution of Finland as enacted on the 11th of June 1999 with amendments up to 2018. I use a translation from Swedish, uh, uh, from Finnish, sorry, uh, with the mention that this translation is not legally binding. Uh, that the, the legally binding text is only that in Finnish and in Swedish. Okay, let's go. Chapter 3, the Parliament and the Representatives. Section 24, the composition and term of the Parliament. The Parliament is unicameral. It consists of 200 representatives who are elected for a term of four years at a time. The term of the Parliament begins when the results of the parliamentary elections have been confirmed at last and lasts until the next parliamentary elections have been held. Uh, here I allow myself what I call an intermezzo, so the distinction between unicameral parliaments versus bicameral ones. Uh, that graphism uh, on the side of the slide represents the two houses of the Polish Parliament, so the Parliament of my home country, Poland. Below, this is the same, so the lower house of the Parliament, and above it is the Senate. So, the usual uh, solution is that a political system or a country can decide whether they want to have one house in the Parliament or two houses. When we have one house, uh, when we have just one house, it is a unicameral system, such as in Finland. When we have two houses, uh, it is a bicameral system, and then usually those houses are called lower and upper. Why having two houses? So why complicating something that already looks complicated? Sometimes. In some countries, uh, we can have a situation uh, when we want to pass legislature through at least two stages of voting. We, we want like a thorough check. And the thorough check happens uh, when elections favor some sort of groups or some sorts of candidates. Uh, 
uh, especially when, f uh, when, for example, we know that in order to run an effective and efficient electoral campaign, you need X millions of dollars to finance the campaign. And then the upper house uh, of, or, uh, of the parliament serves to sort of counterbalance uh, that, uh, let's say, that situation. So the upper house usually is composed of representatives who usually less like, who, you, who usually need like less money in order to get the seat, to get elected. Uh, so, if present in the system, the upper house is usually smaller than the lower one, there are less seats, and it is like less proportional uh, in the election of their members. You will see later in the subsequent slides that I will be discussing what does it mean proportional, because proportional has like a mathematical expression. Okay, let's go back to Finland. Here is section uh, 25. The representatives shall be elected by a direct, proportional and secret vote. Every citizen who has the right to vote has equal suffrage in the elections. Uh, in that first passage, the most important thing is that proportional thing. I will discuss it particularly later in th and essentially the remaining part of the uh, of this presentation of this video is very much focused on uh, that proportional thing. Uh, I put like next to this quote from constitution I put that picture of runners who are at the starting line uh, at the starting line they are not exactly in the starting blocks as I see because the starting blocks are like moved behind them probably for them not to hurt themselves because if when you use starting blocks you need to know how to use them anyway it is the idea of competition why did I put it here because uh, when we have elections especially parliamentary elections there are two rival visions which I'm going to discuss in a moment whether we want those members of the parliament to be representative for like popular support on the one hand or do we want in that parliament just the best ones just those who can acquire and master the most popular support huh? uh, you prob probably know that if you know how to use instagram you can get votes in an election. Huh? It is just a big question whether people who can get votes just by using Instagram are worth uh, representing their citizens, their fellow citizens, in an otherwise serious thing, which is legislature and parliamentary work. So, here in the Finnish case, we have the principle of proportional representation. I discuss it in the subsequent slides and we go further for the pan, uh, for the pan, for the parliamentary elections the country shall be divided on the basis of the number of finnish citizens into at least 12 and at most 18 constituencies in addition the Åland islands shall form their own constituency for the election of one representative constituency is essentially a geographical region in the country, a geographical district. And the idea of uh, representation or the idea of direct democracy is that each constituency should like vote separately. Hmm? That's the idea that uh, different places in the country should have their representation. And Finland is particularly important, or in Finland it is a particularly important thing, because if you look at the map of Finland, uh, you have Helsinki, so the capital, uh, which is uh, really densely populated, where you have like a, a lot of people, and the rest of Finland is very sparsely populated. So if we didn't introduce that split that division into constituencies 
in each parliamentary elections you would have a parliament de facto appointed by the residents of Helsinki, with the rest of the country having little to say uh, in the appointment of those representatives. So this is why uh, the idea of dividing into constituencies. Now another inter interesting thing which I will discuss more in detail in subsequent videos, here I am just signaling the thing, the right to nominate candidates in parliamentary elections belongs to registered political parties and as provided by an act to groups of persons who have the right to vote. Essentially, what we see as citizens, here I am briefly going to get bigger in the window, so, what we see as citizens under the general term of elections is the moment when we vote. But as you can notice, if you have already voted, I know that I am addressing myself to pretty young viewers and listeners, so this is why I am including that if you have already voted. If you have already voted, you know that voting is like going to a restaurant. You choose from a menu. Uh, you choose from a menu of courses and in this case, in the case of elections, it is a menu of candidates. Now, if you think about it, if you ask yourself, okay, but, but how that menu is made? How come that I can vote just for those people on that electoral card and not for other people? Maybe I, I would like to see my neighbor uh, as a member of, of the parliament because I like the guy and he owes me money and he might uh, extend me a favor once in the, in the parliament. Well, if I don't have my neighbor on the electoral list, I cannot vote for him. So, real elections in any political system are composed of two stages or two phases. When we vote, it is phase two, but, uh, the, but phase one consists in making those political menus, in putting people on those electoral lists. And this is what usually takes place like behind the scenes or more behind the scenes, behind the curtain. Uh, and there were attempts there are known attempts to make that first stage, so that to, to make the stage of nominating the candidates as public and as popular as possible. I know that in France a few years ago they had that idea that, for example, uh, if uh, you pay, like, I, I think, 49 euros, you can vote online for, to nominate a candidate in parliamentary elections. I think, I think it was the Republican Party who had the idea. The idea proved suicidary because financially, yes, they had that inflow of all those 49 euros paid by people who expected to have like real impact on the political life of their country. But the lists that they had out of that, uh, of that vote were completely haphazard. Uh, so we remember and and once again, I will develop on that topic in subsequent videos in that path of political systems. Elections have two phases. One phase which we essentially don't see, this is the phase of nominating the people whom we can cast our votes on. And the second phase which we see, it is voting on the candidates. Let's go back to the presentation. So, more detailed provisions on the timing of parliamentary elections, the nomination of candidates, the conduct of the elections and the constituencies are laid down by an act. And I discuss this specific act further. I give just like one short quote from that act in the case of Finland. It is the Election Act number 714 from 1998 with amendments up to, 200, uh, to 2016 included. Now it is something important to remember. 
usually the constitution lays down like the most important principles of parliamentary elections but the, the technical details are left to an act which means that the technicalities of parliamentary elections are on the long run voted and enacted by the parliament itself so in the long perspective like in the perspective of generations or decades the parliaments or, or, or parliaments in general decide about the way that they will be appointed in the future and composed in the future. Once again, intermezzo, so that proportional vote versus majoritarian or plural vote. So th th there is the thing that you have we have two types of direct democracy. Uh, the one based on the philosophy of proportional representation and the one which I temporarily call first past the post, uh, also known as majoritarian, also known as a plural system. Proportional representation aims at reflecting as perfectly as possible the composition of voters' preferences in the final composition of the elected body of representatives. It is like the, the assumption of a perfect world, uh, where every citizen finds somehow the representation in the final composition of those elected bodies, like the parliament. Yet, as you will see later, even in this, uh, in this specific presentation, there are problems with assuring perfectly proportional representation. Essentially, it is almost impossible to assure a perfectly proportional representation. Uh, so there is like an, an, another system, the first past the post, majoritarian or plural. This one focuses on selecting the most representative candidates, so those who collect the most votes. In very brutal terms, it could be said that we don't want losers in the parliament. Uh, maybe you know when there is a movie being made, when there is like a big scene, for example, people in front of a building and those people are supposed to panic uh, when a gunfight suddenly er er erupts in that place. In order to be in that crowd, in the movie, you, you need to be like a secondary character. Those people are hired for this specific scene. They are paid very little money uh, and they are... Sometimes they participate in the shooting just in exchange of, of a coffee of, or of a lunch catered to... Um, uh, catered to, to the setting, but uh, it is frequently similar in politics. When you have a parliament, when you have the members of the parliament who represent a given party, you can bet that if you have like 50 of them uh, uh, representing one and the same party, among those 50 there are five who are like really big important players and you have 45 who just vote as those first five tell them to vote. So in order to like, counterbalance this phenomenon of uh, like losers in the parliament, uh, we have those systems called first past the post. First past the post essentially is a name or a designation which comes from the idea that in order to get a mandate, to get a seat in the parliament, you have to be the best in your district. So you have to be like first past the post. You can be the best or among the best. There are various like detailed solutions, but that's the general idea. So let's get back to Finland. Uh, a short, a short call by what we call snap elections or extraordinary parliamentary elections. So this, in in this case, I will first go to the commentary, which I name intermezzo, and then I will go back to the uh, 
to the constitution of Finland. Here you have that graphism, that picture of like a stylized pit stop in a car race uh, where you have those people who work on like putting back on the wheels uh, someone who is racing. Why did I put it here? Uh, sometimes in the, in the parliamentary system, in a parliament, you can have a situation when the parliament is too balanced, is, exaggerat is exa exaggeratedly balanced. So parties in the parliament have so equal representation, so equal numbers of seats that nobody can really master and have a durable majority. So no policy can be effectively voted. Such a parliament is essentially stuck. It is dysfunctional. You need to shake it off. And then you organize what is called a snap elections or as in this Finnish case, uh, extraordinary elections. Uh, and they essentially sh serve to like shake off and reshuffle the political system in order to make a parliament functional. The idea is quite simple. If we have elections last year, those elections have produced an exag exaggeratedly balanced parliament. If we organize snap elections the following year, some of the political parties of some or some of the players who participated in the last elections are still leaking their financial wounds after that last year elections. They are still paying back the loans that they contracted in, in order to finance their campaign. If we launch a new election now, uh, those guys will just will not just will not will just not be able to uh, master sufficiently much money uh, to run an effective electoral campaign so snap elections serve to like kick out the losers from the race and keep like the just the top dogs in the race so going back to finland the exact constitutional provision here is that the President of the Republic, in response to a recent proposal by the Prime Minister, and after having heard the parliamentary groups and while the Parliament is in session, may order that extraordinary parliamentary elections shall be held. Thereafter, the Parliament shall decide the time when it concludes its work before the elections. One remark. Uh, when I discuss constitutional provisions, I frequently pay attention with my students to vocabulary details. Here you have two modal verbs in that passage. You have may, may order, extraordinary parliamentary elections, and then shall decide. May is weaker, is conditional. It is just the, the, the president can but doesn't have to. Here, when it is written that the parliament shall decide, it means that they are bound to decide. There is no may, there is no can or, 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 or maybe they wouldn't, they shall do it. So here I, I quickly connect to uh, my last video on the forms of political power in that one sentence in that one passage from the Finnish constitution you have political power of three different players you have the president you have the prime minister and you have the parliament because you notice that the whole thing can be uh, effective only when the parliament is in session so the president and the prime minister cannot agree to launch snap elections whilst the parliament is not in session, while the uh, uh, so when the parliament is sort of inactive for a moment, so the parliament is like necessary here, and then the parliament shall decide the time when it concludes its work before the elections. So even if the president decides to order extraordinary snap elections, the parliament has the last word as for the agenda of parliamentary work 
before those, if, uh, those snap elections take place. Okay, let's go further. Now I have that uh, little quote from the Finland Election Act. I r return here to the problem of representation and proportional representation. Why, how it works m mathematically and what could be the problems with that. So first comes the quote from the Election Act. Section 6. With the exception of the electoral district of Aland, a total of 199 representatives are elected by proportional vote in the other electoral districts. In the electoral district of Aland, one representative is elected as provided below. The division is carried out by dividing the number of Finnish citizens in each electoral district by the combined number of Finnish citizens in all electoral districts and multiplying this number by 199. The number of parliamentary seats for each electoral district corresponds to the whole number derived from this calculation. If all seats are not divided in this manner, the remainder of the seats are divided in descending order between the electoral districts according to the decimal fractions derived from the calculation. Looks complicated, so let's break it down. It is the idea, this passage embodies the concept of quantitative representation. So, as you have those maths hidden in the text, it goes like that. So, we have a number of seats in the parliament or house, divided by the number of people in the country who have active voting rights. So, so who can vote? And th that division gives us the average, the arithmetical average number of voters re represented by one elected official. And in the theory of politics, and pretty much in the, in the reality of politics too, it is assumed that the electoral regime is workable, that it serves like a real purpose of representation and a real purpose of l political legitimation through direct democracy, when this number of voters represented by one elected official is as even as possible across the political landscape. So a situation, for example, in a country when one member of the parliament uh, has been elected with 70,000 votes and another one has been elected with just 5,000 votes, this is unhealthy. That leads to political tensions which on the long run can make the system explode or can make the system dysfunctional. The, the good idea, the good practice is to have each of those members of the parliament having the seat they have after getting a certain number of votes, which is more or less the same for each of those guys and girls in the parliament. So here we come to that quote from the Finnish uh, Election Act. So we have, first of all, the number of Finnish, cit of Finnish citizens in each electoral district divided by the combined number of Finnish citizens in all electoral districts. The combined number of Finnish citizens in all electoral districts, in other words, it is the total number of voters in Finland. So the denominator is what you can pretty much understand as the nation for the needs of parliamentary elections. So we just calculate, so that first sentence, dividing the number of Finnish citizens in each electoral district by the combined number of Finnish citizens in all electoral districts, it simply means that we calculate what percentage of the total voting population is present in each given district. And then we multiply that percentage by 199 seats and 
we assume that the number of seats assigned to the district is proportional to the percentage of voting population in the district. Once again, this is this idea of quantitative representation. Approximately the same number of votes per each seat in the parliament. And here we have that problem of fractional results in proportional representation. I return to that quote from the Election Act. The number of parliamentary seats for each electoral district corresponds to the whole number derived from this calculation. So from that percentage of voting population times the number of seats times nine, uh, 199. If all seats are not divided in this manner, the remainder of the seats are divided in descending order between the electoral districts according to the decimal fractions derived from the calculation. Now, when you take empirical numbers and you take percentage of the voting population in a district and you multiply it by 199 or by any other uh, integer, by any other whole number, you usually have a whole number decimal point plus like a strict decimal fraction. So, for example, you have two, uh, two comma or 2.36. You have the whole number here, the two, and then you have the strict decimal fraction, the 0 0.36. Now, you cannot assign uh, 3600 of a mandate or 3600 of a seat to a, any uh, to a, anyone you need a whole number of seats assigned to each district so what to do with those fractions in finland one possible answer so the one that we have in finland is rank those decimals the strict decimal fraction after the decimal point mind you there are other systems for example, there are systems uh, when we are quite uh, brutal and we just kick those decimals out of the game. Huh? Sorry guys, too bad that your vote found, found it, it itself being in the 0 0.36. Sorry. So, I give you the example how it works in Finland, how to interpret that specific quote from their, electoral, from their election act. We have three districts. District A, which after the initial calculation gets 7.45 seats. District B, which 5.78 seats. And District C, 3.89 seats. So, in the first count, so if we just count the whole numbers, the integers, District A gets 7 seats, so it is the 7 out of 7.45. District B has 5 seats, and District C gets 3 seats. In, that, in, in the second round of assignment, District C has the highest rank, because it has the highest strict decimal after the decimal point. It has 0 0.89. Then comes District B, and District A comes as third. So in that specific case, with those numbers, fractions remaining after the first count would be inversely uh, uh, represented. So whatever is the remaining number of seats to be divided between those fractions, C would get the greatest number of those seats because they have, they have the greatest fraction after the coma. So we, we could say that it's like an, an over-representation of those fractions. And finally, the last remark. Why we uh, have that principle of quantitative representation? It is interesting, but as you observe the strategies of political parties and generally electoral strategies by many candidates, those strategies are prepared with the assumption that one needs to get a certain number of votes in order to have reasonable certainty of getting a seat in the parliament. For example, 
if I, I know my political system enough to know that I need, for example, at least 20,000 votes in order to be relatively certain that I've got a seat. Remember, when you observe electoral results, first of all, you have the number of votes you have. And only then those votes are recalculated into percentages, like in a second phase. So in the, let's say, the by the book constitutional approach, the number of votes that a candidate gets is a percentage of total votes cast. But when I am a political player, when I am a candidate, or when I am a spin doctor who directs the, the electoral campaign of a candidate, my approach is different. Essentially, I assume that I don't have any influence on the total number of votes cast in a country or in a constituency. It is just beyond my reach to influence the total number. Sometimes I can give it a little prod, up or down, but essentially it is uh, like a structural characteristic of the whole electoral system. So my strategic approach is different. I assume that the number of votes obtained is based on the total number of voters whom I effectively reached in my campaign. So uh, it is based, the number of votes I get is based on the number of people whom I effectively met in electoral meetings, whom I engaged in a conversation via social media, uh, whom I could have reached by my advertising and so on. So I have that target. And I assume that the number, that the target I need to reach in order to win is proportional to the number of votes I needed to get in order to be elected. So my strategy is calibrated on the specific quantitative representation in place in my electoral system. So the number of voters I need to reach is proportional to the number of votes I need to get a seat. And that serves me to budget my, com my campaign and that serves me to plan my campaign. Okay, that would be all uh, in the video about the fundamentals of electoral regimes. I hope it was interesting. Once again, as always, as usually, have fun with science and please have fun with your life. Bye.